Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and it's great to be here to be talking uh, about this project. Uh, what we're going to do today is run through a little bit about the excavations in 1980. Um, we're going to have a food vessel interlude with Marta Innes telling you about the pot that was discovered. And then I'm going to pick up again and talk about the community engagement program projects that we've been running really for the last two years uh, on this project uh, in Kirkcaldy with various people. But first I want to say a lot of thank yous. Uh, this isn't the Oscars, so I'll be quick about this. Um, there's lots of people here. Um, as academic lead for this project, I want to acknowledge um, and we're presenting the results of a lot of work by a lot of different individuals and also to um, a number of local community partners uh, as well. And um, how this project has really evolved has been addressing some of the questions that have come up from local people about that original excavation, ideas about what people were wearing in the Bronze Age, and what did people eat, what were they doing, but also too about the later urban archaeology of Kirkcaldy High Street as well. Uh, and that's what we'll really kind of focus on um, today. So legacy excavation projects, unpublished ones, create a whole series of challenges and opportunities for us as archaeologists. We don't have to always dig everything up um, to make new knowledge and create new understandings of the past. And one of the um, reasons for setting up this project was really to address the unpublished excavation archive of Alex Morrison, a former colleague um, at the University of Glasgow. And this is one of around 10 of Alex's unpublished published excavations um, that we wanted to look for. And I think if you look in the background um, of the um, image of him, I think you can just see, uh, a, again, a whole series of um, files and folders from all these unpublished excavations. Now, the site that we were looking at was a, a rescue excavation in 1980. It was a two-day excavation um, at a site at the back of, um, to the rear of Kirkcaldy High Street, where builders uncovered uh, a Bronze Age kist burial. And Glasgow and Alex got involved because the first archaeological responder on the site, um, who was from Kirkcaldy Galleries, um, Jean Glaster, um, and at the time, they expected that this was a, a, a probable beaker burial, um, like others that had been found in Kirkcaldy, um, sites like Oriel Road, excavated by child in the 1940s. Um, Alex and the University of Glasgow got involved because Jane phoned round to try and get some archaeological assistance for the excavation, um, and Glasgow uh, responded uh, positively uh, to that invitation. And the um, resulting excavation um, was undertaken over two days, but then was never written up by Alex. Um, it was left and the archive was distributed between the University of Glasgow and material that went to Kirkcaldy Galleries at Fife Cultural Trust in 1985. So our project digging up Kirkcaldy's Bronze Age stories was very much to try and find out something about this excavation uh, because it had a very meagre um, documentary archive. We wanted also to uh, to think about how we could use it creatively uh, for opportunities for early career researchers and also for students, both undergraduates and uh, top postgraduates. We wanted to gather new knowledge um, about the site and also use it as a mechanism to reevaluate some other Bronze Age excavations in Kirkcaldy, um, sites like Oriel Road from the 1940s uh, and also some others, and bring that knowledge back um, into uh, a conversation with the local community. Uh, and we also wanted to share and celebrate um, finally getting round after 40 years to seeing the site written up and published, but also to how that material could be used positively for the community um, in sustainable tourism and also other initiatives in terms of placemaking uh, and revitalisation uh, of Kirkcaldy High Street as well. So a quick summary then of the excavation. Um, there were three kists identified. Uh, one of them uh, was kist number three, uh, which was very much um, built into uh, an overlying uh, wall. Uh, kist number one, which was the first one exposed by the builders, um, contained an adult male individual, uh, the food vessel, which we'll hear a bit more about shortly, and some lithic artefacts. Um, this was a male individual in a crouched uh, burial position. And the second kist, uh, 
was a mortared, uh, built into a mortared wall and they, they had to excavate back into the wall section um, to recover the material from that. It had an adult inhumation, very poorly preserved, uh, some cremated uh, human remains. Uh, the probably one individual, but the uh, technology of the cremated bones suggests that we've probably got two cremated uh, assemblages present uh, within that kist. And we also had some uh, later sherds and um, a classic bit of um, Kirkcaldy material culture, a piece of linoleum as well uh, in there. And we know that this material and these kists are probably, this wasn't just the first encounter um, with this archeology span um, potentially in the historic period. So we've got some other work results coming, um, so I get a bit more to come back to um, in terms of the human remains and also pathogen and ancient DNA work um, that we're undertaking uh, with the Crick Institute in Oxford. Now the archaeological finds um, from the KIST, um, Alex had reported in Discovery and Excavation, which was the only publication output um, from the site, two um, artefacts, um, a, a small arrowhead and also a, a knife. Um, and he um, didn't mention this artifact at all. Um, I think that's because he wasn't quite sure what it was. Um, and it's actually a really interesting piece. It's a strikolite that has quite extensive wear and traces. It would have been um, an item of personal um, use um, over a period of time. And also too, at the time of deposition, it's also um, an ancestral heirloom in that it's fashioned on a piece of a polished stone ax head uh, as well. Um, so those artifacts um, associated uh, with uh, our individual from KISS number one. When the site was first discovered, the local newspaper re reported it as a beaker. Um, and it's not actually a beaker burial at all. Um, it's a food vessel. And the um, history of the food vessel and the um, work that we did on the project, while well, the food vessel was reconstructed in the 1980s um, at Glasgow, um, it was in a quite poor state of um, condition and through the auspices of Jane Friel um, at Fife Cultural Trust and curator um, of this material um, we were looking to get some remedial conservation done um, and that was eventually funded by the Friends of Kirkcaldy Gallery so you can go and see the food vessel in its restored state um, in the cases um, in uh, Kirkcaldy uh, at the moment but I'm going to pass over to Marta who's going to tell us all about this food vessel. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to try and very briefly and very quickly summarize my um, um, analysis of this food vessel for you. Um, we've also got um, a replica of the pot that's been done for us by uh, Graham Taylor. So if anyone's interested, you can come up and have a look and touch it as well. Um, um, so I'm going to start off with um, some general background on food vessels in Scotland and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how our food vessel fits within uh, the overall Scottish corpus as well. Um, so the term food vessel um, uh, is nowadays used as a label to describe one of the, one of the prehistoric ceramic types that is found uh, throughout the British Isles um, and which dates um, generally to the early Bronze Age. Uh, food vessels are found mainly in funerary contexts um, and often in flat kiss graves like the ones that we see in Kirkcaldy. Um, and um, chronologically they overlap with other um, ceramics such as beakers and uh, different types of um, cinerary urns. Um, now in Scotland there are over or just about uh, 560 recognised examples of food vessels uh, which I've been able to um, re-record, re-analyze and uh, map to create an up-to-date um, corpus. Um, now in terms of morphology, um, the food vessel type is quite um, heterogeneous, quite diversified. So here you can see examples of, um, so that, of food, uh, four uh, food vessels. Um, and as you can see, they uh, vary quite considerably in size, form and decoration. Um, Generally, food vessels range from 10 to 20 centimeters in height, um, and they feature um, impressed um, and incised decoration. But the type definition is pretty broad, and, and pretty much um, anything that is not a beaker um, or a scenery urn could be classed as a food vessel, which is not very um, useful, really. <laughs> um, um, 
um, the, the label, the food vessel label was originally coined by um, the early antiquarians who needed to distinguish this uh, new ceramic type from uh, the already recognized beakers and urns. Um, and it was originally assumed that these were meant to contain um, an offering of food for the afterlife. Uh, some residue studies suggest that um, some of these pots at least uh, did um, serve as containers for food or they were used for preparing food or cooking food. Uh, but obviously we don't know what the um, actual intention behind these um, deposits uh, and burials uh, was. Uh, now, in the past, a lot of food vessel research uh, focused on developing uh, food vessel typologies, um, often suggesting that there was a specific um, a, but quite enigmatic <laughs> pattern behind the distribution of different food vessel types. Um, now, having looked at around 560 Scottish food vessels, I would argue that there is no such clear pattern so there's not one single attribute um, or any sets of attributes that would be consistently uh, contextually or regionally specific in a way that would warrant um, um, an identification of any types really. So instead uh, we see these different food vessel attributes um, are being sort of creatively reused um, and reshuffled in various um, countless combinations on vessels from across Scotland um, and throughout the early Bronze Age. Uh, so, um, oh, this is just the distribution of the corpus in Scotland. Uh, so you can see um, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, they appear pretty much um, anywhere where you find Bronze Age stuff, uh, you might find a food vessel as well. Um, now, according to what I said about the typologies and so on, uh, when looking at our food vessel from Kirkcaldy, my aim was to try and situate it within the corpus by looking for these links between our vessel, the, the different attributes of our vessel um, and vessels from across Scotland. And I'm going to illustrate it with some examples uh, based specifically on the vessel form and decoration. Um, so this is our food vessel here. Um, in terms of the form, you can see it's got this heavy uh, molded beveled rim. Uh, these two um, carinations, or these two ridges here. Uh, quite a wide cavetta zone between the ridges. Um, and this vase-like uh, straight-sided profile, uh, lower body profile, um, as opposed to a sort of rounded uh, belly. Um, it's decorated with comb impressions um, and it features this very um, characteristic um, herringbone motif. Uh, so there's no um, sort of um, uh, no 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 clear there's, there's no clear sort of direct comparanda for our food vessels in Scotland in that there's no food vessels that would feature the same form and the same decoration obviously um, and this is quite a sort of defining a feature of the corpus there's no food vessels that would be exactly alike uh, but we can trace these different elements and various food vessels across Scotland different attributes of form and decoration uh, here are three examples of pots that feature a similar profile. So these two carination and a sort of vase-like lower body. Uh, but in each case, you can see the decoration is quite different. So we've got a range of different decorative motifs that are uh, features on, featured on these vessels. Uh, we do find pots that share a similar form and also feature a um, herringbone motif. Um, and you can see three examples here. Um, but in each case, the decoration is done with a different um, tool. So we've got a range of different implements represented here. This is incised with the sharp tool. Uh, here we've got a whipped cord. Um, and here we have, uh, lower down, we've got twisted cord. Um, but we do also find vessels that feature comb and press herringbone, um, which you can see on these three examples. But in these cases, uh, the form is now different. Uh, so we've got a sort of more globular lower body here. Uh, we've got the addition of the lugs here, um, and this one with a much narrower cavetta zone and a, a more um, a wider um, upright neck. Uh, so all these are quite unique, but they are clearly still very much linked uh, by the presence of these very recognizable features as well. Uh, and we can also illustrate these connections, the sort of interregional um, connections, by mapping some of these attributes. Um, so this is the distribution of all food vessels that feature the herringbone motif. Um, and as you can see, they can appear across the corpus area in Scotland. So they're not regionally specific at all. 
Um, and the same is also the case for vessels that feature this um, general profile with two carination and a sort of vase like lower body. Um, so I think our food vessel is a really good example of um, this very malleable tradition, this sort of tradition that relies on these networks of references and this shared creative repertoire of decorative choices. Um, and it's also a very good example of how utilizing a corpus reference resource uh, can be useful in tracing these links um, and seeing how this different tra this tradition is materialized very differently across Scotland um, in different vessels. And also just being able to add this pot to our corpus also um, allows to put the site kind of added to the map and see how these sort of food vessel influences um, are interconnected um, across Scotland. Um, and I think that's all for me. Okay, thanks, Michael. Okay, so I'm going to pick up again just to um, talk through some of the public engagement activities and events that we did um, to bring this excavation back uh, to Kirkcaldy and also some of the things um, that we did uh, to do that and ask questions um, and to get people's collect in the year of stories, people's stories around um, some of this activity. Um, there was a series of other um, individual displays that were created by the Old Kirk Trust uh, as well uh, on the Bronze Age and stimulated um, by uh, the start of this project that also included some school kids drawings from the 1940s of um, child, the material that was filed, found during child's excavations at Oriel Road. But we also took inspiration from the actual site specificity of the site, can't say that, sorry, um, in terms of uh, the site is behind um, this part of High Street, this new block of um, buildings in here. Um, Kerry's photography um, we used as a, as a pop-up uh, photographic exhibition on, and then um, we went back um, this last September and hired out the upstairs studio for a pop-up display as part of um, our most recent event. Uh, and we also then took inspiration from the community-run um, bike shop uh, on the site to create a cycle uh, route, uh, a new cycle route and a new heritage resource um, for Concordia, looking at the Bronze Age activity and also to um, the uh, bringing in other excavations. We've also responded again to some of the questions that local people had about what did people wear um, and one of our um, former master students, um, Olivia Ballard, produced these wonderful Bronze Age replica garments um, that, will also, that were also involving uh, the local Kirkcaldy Gallery sewing circle uh, and we also did a series of talks um, and also met and discussed uh, what we were looking for um, and interested in hearing from local people uh, about the site. And uh, the most recent one um, was the launch of Bike Back to the Bronze Age, um, a trial run um, of a new cycle route and walking route for Kirkcaldy that takes you around various Bronze Age, um, mostly kissed burial sites uh, in the town uh, and other archeology span stopping off at Kirkcaldy galleries to see some of the artifacts uh, and also to, um, again sharing some of the results of some of the community work that we've done on, on Kirkcaldy High Street and I just want to run through a little bit of some of the recollections um, that we gathered as a result of that um, and through student interviews uh, with local people and we were fortunate to talk to Susie Goodseer whose um, family uh, ran um, the butcher shop which was in the same position as where the bike shop is now um, and again her recollections not just of the recovery and discovery of the excavations um, in the 1980s but also to her recollections of how buzzing um, Kirkcaldy High Street was um, back in the day. We also got involved in some other site stories, um, particularly uh, one of the things that we were able to do was to resolve, thanks to the um, split documentation of the site in Fife um, Cultural Trust's archives, we were actually to pinpoint the precise location of the kist, which had not been particularly clear from the documentation that we had in Glasgow. And we were particularly interested um, in this um, property here, which was the footprint of this was being cleared and discovered the first uh, kist. This had been um, a Green Tree Temperance Hotel. It was also a Fife, um, Fife Health Board offices uh, before it was demolished um, in the late 1990s. Um, and just for a bit of reference here, um, Old Kirk here, Kirk Wind, uh, and this um, is just the uh, butcher shop uh, just in here um, on High Street. 
Now, one of the reasons that we, we um, found out about this was through um, a local businesswoman, Gillian um, Bartholomew Devine, um, who approached us after seeing our pop-up photography uh, in Kerry's and also came along to our November event um, held in conjunction um, at the Kirkcaldy Galleries, our series of talks. And she shared her family history research with, her, with us. Uh, Gillian is the great-great-niece um, of a man called uh, Walter Bartholomew, who lived in the house. Um, um, and died in 1906. Uh, and Walter uh, was a local businesswoman, a uh, businessman, sorry. He was um, a former distillery owner of Ockentool Distillery. Um, and he also um, was very fond of reminiscing um, about um, Kirkcaldy um, back in the day. Um, it sounds a very convivial um, character. But he's buried um, in the old Kirk um, Cemetery and we included um, a stop off in our heritage trail um, of Walter to presence um, some of the later archaeology um, of the site uh, as well as the Bronze Age material. So our project is also exploring how we can restory some of these other um, hidden assets, I guess, around Bronze Age archaeology um, in Kirkcaldy, um, including Priory Park, which was an excavation undertaken in the 1990s by Peter Yeoman. Um, and um, here you can see one of our students um, telling the um, inaugural bike ride out group um, all about uh, this excavation. Uh, and also too, we've been re-looking through some of the archival material, again, to think about some other quotes and stories that we can um, connect uh, back in to some of that archaeology. And just before we finish for tea, I want to talk about um, this site and uh, some of the um, interesting things that came out um, of interviews that we did with Dougie Burnett. And Dougie Burnett was a former Balwiri High School pu pupil, um, but he also had a bit of a luck in when he was doing his student um, work placement experience um, because he happened to be working in Kirkcaldy Galleries and volunteering there on the week that the excavation uh, took place in the 1980s. Um, and Dougie went on to um, do two archaeology degrees, have a career, as an archaeozoologist um, uh, and then um, changed uh, profession. But he told us about this site, um, which is the relocated kist from the 1963 excavations by Audrey Henshaw at Ash Grove in Methil Hill, um, and um, how this lovely quote about um, some of the uses, at least, and there were some other things that I haven't put on a slide, I think we can all use our imaginations there, um, about this activity. And one of the school pupils, current school pupils, who came along to our pop-up in September was astounded to recognise this site. Um, and also had no real um, knowledge at all about its prehistoric origins. Um, so at the moment, um, with Jane Friel um, at um, Five Cultural Trust, we're looking into the history of how um, the Ashgrove Kist reconstru was reconstructed um, at a high school uh, and also looking to capture some of the contemporary stu students' engagements um, with this project. So to draw to a close then, um, this re-excavation um, of a legacy archive project has been really productive, not just in terms of redressing an unpublished excavation um, and sharing it with various communities, not just in Kirkcaldy, but again, our own archaeological community, but in also um, enabling us to look at different ways that we can engage um, more creatively um, with the backlog of unpublished excavations that, that again, archaeology's little guilty secret of those unpublished excavations, um, but think more creatively of ways that we can um, re-excavate some of that archive um, and do some work on it. You can follow our progress on the public website. I'm sure there's more stories still to come um, and we're looking at publishing uh, the site and some of the other work um, next year. And please do come up um, and engage with our replica food vessel. Thank you all. <laughs>